Good morning. Welcome to Friday Coffee Meetup. I'm Christy Connor, your host. Friday Coffee Meetup is the largest active innovation, entrepreneurial, and tech meetup in Los Angeles, California. We are traditionally an in-person meetup, but due to COVID, we have gone virtual. One of the great things about going virtual is that we get to have amazing speakers from across the country. And this morning, we have Dr. Tony Addy here with us this morning. He's going to be speaking in a little while, and he's based in North Carolina. One of the wonderful things about this Friday Coffee Meetup community is that we seem to be everywhere. Although I invited Dr. Tony Addy to come and join for Friday Coffee Meetup, I didn't know we actually had a similar Friday Coffee Meetup connection through David Pendergrass, who happens to be one of Phenonics corporate attorneys. So it's amazing how far this network goes and what these connections can bring. So we are going to be introducing him in just a moment. But first, I would like to say a huge thank you to the people behind the scenes who make this happen each week. Although you are seeing my face right now, there's actually a whole host of people who make this happen each week and I would love to show you their faces. So I'm gonna bring them up here. This is the team. They do everything from our YouTube channel to organizing speakers and, and bringing them in to logistics and our meetup and our website across the board. So we are so grateful for them and all of their work. We're also grateful for you, our attendees. We know it's been a difficult and challenging time and we really appreciate how you still create community. You come out and support us. We are so happy to have you here. I wanted to run through a few logistical things as we get started. Our Q&A today will happen after our speaker. It's done through the Q&A panel at the bottom center. We have the chat window open. You can say hi to everybody, banter back and forth, um, but we don't moderate the chat window. So be on your best behavior here in the Zoom meeting and put your questions into the Q&A panel. I will aggregate those at the end and get through as many questions as I can in the process. At the end, once we wrap up from Q&A, we will have open networking. So if you're interested in sticking around and talking to Tony and talking to some of the other members, stay on the line and we'll move you over into the panelist pool after we complete turning off LinkedIn Live and the other areas. With that, I am so honored to introduce Dr. Tony Addy this morning. He is the CEO, the director and co-founder of Phenonic and he's going to be speaking to us today about riding the lightning and disrupting industry. I actually learned about Tony through the USC magazine. My father had read an article about him titled Dr. Cool, which is appropriate. And he said, you have to read this article. This is amazing. And I read the article and I thought, wow, this is incredible. And then my father said, you should ask him to come to Friday Coffee Meetup. So I asked. And they said yes, and we are so pleased to have him here with us this morning. He does have other connections to the Southern California community. He did his PhD at USC, right on. And he also worked at NASA JPL. He's going to be speaking with us this morning about his company, Phenonic, and how they are disrupting industry, not just one industry, but a number of industries by replacing compressor-based technology with solid-state solutions. This is really cool. With that, I'd love to welcome Tony here with us this morning. Thank you for joining us. We are so pleased to have you here. Good morning. Thank you for that, for that warm introduction. How are you doing this morning, Christy? And thank you to all your participants who are streaming in uh, online right now. I'm delighted to be here. It's so great to have you here. I'm looking well, forward I, to learning more from you this morning. Well, what I thought I'd do, and, and, and there's many times I've been asked to participate on panels for entrepreneurship and, and the journey, because it, it really is that. I have to completely tell you, though, that this is my, my favorite. So my, my time at USC was one of the greatest in my life. Normally, I would be sporting the Cardinal in gold. But later on this afternoon, we have a bunch of guests from UNC Chapel Hill here. So our, our team has asked me to be respectful to our guests, and I'm in Carolina Blue. 
Uh, but it, the next time COVID lets up and we can travel, I'm back in Pasadena, which is my home for five years. And as I was chatting with some of you before we started, I was a fixture at Tui's in Alhambra and San Marino every Saturday morning for a full stack of their homemade buttermilk pancakes. So just talking about that is a great way to start the morning. Um, what I thought I would do, uh, there's many times we've been asked to talk about the, the entrepreneurial journey we've been on at Phononic. And it's sometimes easy because storytelling is such an important part of the entrepreneurial journey that what I thought I would do is, is walk your listeners and participants through sort of an all-purpose standard investor presentation, give them my, my thoughts along the way, how, the, how the, the deck came together, the key pieces that investors look for. But as we find that thread in that narrative, I can share with all of you the good, bad, and the ugly decisions that we've had to make in the now decade that it's taken for us to become an overnight success. And I think it's a particularly powerful way for your, for your listeners and viewers to understand the journey, the decisions that are made along the way, but perhaps more importantly, hearing from a friend uh, what investors are looking for, listening for, because they don't often tell you that up front. Wonderful. We're looking forward to it. Great. Well, with that, I'm going to share my screen and bring up a presentation. As I introduce all of you to Phononic, it, it's, it's perhaps noteworthy to sort of mention how the company got started. Um, so having a background in R&D, as you mentioned, um, through my experiences at USC, I had the opportunity to really be exposed to the venture capital community on the West Coast. Much of my research and development at SC and then as a postdoc at JPL was very applied in the area of electronic, organic, and energetic materials. Um, fixated with the entrepreneurial and startup world, I've started my narrative and the presentation that you're about to see with this lead slide, it's almost been the same in every single presentation I've ever given. The graphics might now be demonstrably better than they were when I first started in the presentation, but there's really a powerful theme that as entrepreneurs, you wanna be able to communicate to the investment community. In this particular instance, Silicon Valley appropriately named because silicon as a semiconductor material has transformed our way of life. Data, communications, solar, LED lighting have all been transfixed by semiconductor innovation. Yet in the world of refrigeration and cooling, we're almost 200 years in and still dependent upon unsustainable mechanical incumbents, typically compressor-based systems. This thesis was prevent, presented to me by what would become my co-founder at Venrock Associates, Matt Trevithick, as they were investigating and searching for material science themes that could give rise to the next multi-billion dollar opportunity for semiconductor delivery or semiconductor performance. We've zeroed in on this opportunity. Right there is a hook where investors, technical backgrounds or not, can get a general understanding of what it is that we're trying to do. The next couple of slides are a plain spoken way of introducing your technology. And it really doesn't matter if it's a service technology or hardware company, identifying a theme and communicating it in investor friendly terms is critically important. In our case, we had a, we had a double barrel against us when we founded the company. The concepts of semiconductor cooling called the thermoelectric principles, of which JPL had a world-renowned research group when I was there, are almost as old as the fundamental concepts of vapor compression. The additional problem that we had is thermoelectric cooling had been just commercially viable enough to be a small niche market, but had never really cracked through to the mainstream markets, the mass markets that investors care about. So we had to identify what it was of the solid state principles that made them promising, compare and contrast those to the mechanical techniques of the incumbent vapor compression system, and then chart a roadmap of discernible technical proof points that were bite sizable enough for investors to fund. Keep remembering that because I'm gonna come back to use of proceeds later on in the conversation. Based upon some absolutely backbreaking work that I won't take you through, it was very important for us to capture and summarize our technical value proposition that identified and achieved specific commercial proof points ascertained by me and my team going to the market and understanding what they wanted, what they would like, but perhaps most importantly, what do they really need? And this way I could communicate to investors that with their early dollars, 
each white bubble that you see on the screen gave rise to some kind of technical innovation that chipped away at the shortcomings or the obstacles needed to compete mainstream. Based upon that work, we went and got third party technical validation where someone could measure our effectiveness based upon the parameters that mattered for commercial viability. So if you stop right there and look at the first section of the presentation, defining theme that's understandable for technical and non-technical investors alike, quantitative technical work that's fundable and measurable, and then measurable performance validated by third parties that confirms your investment thesis or at least its support. It's very technical, it's very blocking and tackling, which is why you have to then remember to rise up and articulate in more emotional terms, what's in it for you or me? So based on all of that technical work, you now have a fundamental cooling approach that gives rise to a collection of features that you can see on this screen that fundamentally impact how you live in beneficial ways. Now you've transitioned from a theme to a technology innovation to a market opportunity based upon a value proposition. Now, where do you go from here? Based on that work, and you referenced disrupting industries, it's very romantic to talk about the disruption that companies deliver until you have to do the work. So when you reference Ride the Lightning, Lightning which is a company motto, where that came from is through these first seven or eight slides, it was absolutely the world of the unknown. And as the entrepreneur, your team tends to look to you to have all the answers. And after coming up with as many as I could on either technical challenges or market challenges, at some point I just got frustrated in the beginning with our core founding team and said, gang, we're just gonna have to ride the lightning and figure it out. And that's why behind me is a mounted album from Metallica of Ride the Lightning, because we've lived it. So the biggest challenge an entrepreneur has is it's hard enough when you have one market, what do you do when you have six? And this is really where the lessons painful at times have been learned that I want to share with all of you. The concept that I tell to my team is don't ask, tell. And that's been learned through really hard work. When you look at the pictures on this slide, all of, you, all of whom have acute and often very common cooling requirements, understanding the market dynamics, understanding their pain points, and understanding some kind of a selection criteria based on aggressive or proactive market research and sales engagement matters. Well, at Phenonic, we didn't do any of it. The market drivers and roadmap that we started with was very unclear. So based on what we thought was an incredible 30 some odd billion dollar market opportunity, we were so anxious to prove to the market what we can do. And this is probably the single greatest challenge for entrepreneurs listening or participating in the call is trying to figure out where to start, how to start, and how to price. We did it all wrong. And on slide 10, it, it's, I, sometimes this is my favorite slide to present because I get to become a revisionist historian and make it sound like I did it all right. Well, what we did was brute force. If you look at the left, these were all, at times, unbelievably painful methods where Phononic, depending on the day, let alone the year, was a chip manufacturer, a component assembly manufacturer, and even a manufacturer of finished refrigerators and freezers. Because of the market opportunity? No. Because of the economics? No. But because the market didn't believe that we could even get cold, let alone compete, we, put, we brought on the cloak and made ourselves whatever we needed to be. It's expensive. It's backbreaking. It gave rise to an incredible intellectual property story. But along the way, it candidly almost broke the company. So the lesson learned is spending some time up front on some market investigation, understanding what the market needs, what the market wants, bifurcating between the two, and implementing that into a product roadmap ultimately gives you the business model that you see on the far right of this presentation is based on all of that hard work. What have we learned? Let's take stock at what we're good at. Let's define our ecosystem and then determine the actual areas where we should be the direct seller or the direct licensor in our case of the appropriate technology. One of the lessons one of my earliest investors shared with me that I'll share with all of you Define your unit of commerce. Make it easy to understand for investors what you make, what you sell, 
what you license and why. And it doesn't matter if it's a semiconductor chip, it doesn't matter if it's a software algorithm, follow and apply those respective principles. So based upon those really hard lessons learned, where our market selection was done by pride, which then transitioned into economics, we're now incredibly well positioned to leverage the value proposition and have now seen over the last two years, tremendous growth. I wanted to share with you what happens when you focus. So based on all of that hard work, we made the decision about 18 months ago that there were macro market themes where we had a disproportionate value proposition. I'm not one to lecture on business books, but Peter Thiel's zero to one was pretty powerful because if you have a 10x advantage in the market, exploit it. So what had become a product development roadmap based on pride was now one based on performance. Our chips are mission critical in 5G and LiDAR communication and optical networks. Understand it, own it, drive it. That's been a powerful theme for us. Second, food storage and delivery. With billions of people communicating from home and ordering groceries from home, we actually did some forethought in market research identified an incredible opportunity in food curbside pickup and delivery where perishable goods were getting wasted and developed a portable refrigerated and frozen technique that can automate warehouses, curbside pickup, and ultimately home delivery. And one of the earliest markets where we had proven our technology in vaccine and drug storage well before COVID hit has now absolutely become central to the, co to the company. But even here, there's a powerful lesson for all of you to learn, which is when do you ride the wave, when do you ride the trend, and when do you stick to your guns? We've been telling people for years that not only did our vaccine refrigerators provide a sustainable solution, but unprecedented vaccine protection. Well, sadly, until COVID really took over, nobody really cared that much. Well, now seeing this dramatic impact in the market, We've been pulled in a million different directions by people who now want our technology. Gratifying, but defocusing. We've identified administration sites as a key area of our value, have flagship customers in that segment, and have learned to respectfully say no to some people because we're better suited in other areas. So again, powerful theme, technology proof points, market and sales driven roadmap, not an engineering driven roadmap, defining your unit of commerce, identifying markets and attacking them, and staying disciplined through thick and thin. Based on that, we've now been given some credibility by investors. We've built sustainable, not just environmentally, but financially sustainable in, uh, businesses, where now people are aggressively coming to us and asking for product roadmap capabilities that they're willing to fund. And the way we did that is we went to our customers, 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 understand what they needed, and then worked it back into our product and technology development roadmap. Now comes the fun part. So in the last 10 minutes, I want to cover the sort of all-purpose stuff that you have to have in your deck and try and navigate what you're hearing from investors, angel, venture, private equity, your aunts and uncles. So the beginning of what I've covered are sort of the blocking and tackling to introduce your company now are some things that you got to have, and it's difficult depending upon where you are in development. The team, it might be an army of one. It might be a comprehensive team, depending on where you are in the stage of development. The one thing I will caution you on, the team that got you through technology development is not the same team that gets you your first customer. It's not the same team that scales your revenue, and it's not the same team that gets you to profitability. Doesn't mean you're not loyal, doesn't mean you don't keep those people as parts of the organization, but changes in the org structure, leadership, and accountability is needed if you're going to grow and scale your business. Painful but powerful lessons that we've learned at Phenonic, and even some that have been affected along the way now see where we are, and more importantly, see the value of their equity and recognize why as entrepreneurs and boards, we made the decisions that we did. The next piece is art. I'm always asked this question by, by entrepreneurs. How do we present our pro forma financials? So in celebration of the NHL just kicking off, here's a picture of your hockey stick. Every investor tells you they hate to see it. Don't show me a hockey stick. Then every investor gives you a hard time if it's not in your presentation. So what do you do? 
Well, if you follow the inflection of the hockey stick, and if you've done proactive market and sales research, and if you've gone out to engage your customer before you engage down a costly product development roadmap, you can build a bottoms up market-driven pro forma narrative as opposed to just looking at a big market and telling somebody that you're going to take a percentage of it someday because of your technology value proposition. Please don't do that. Take the time, whether it's your time or others, and invest in a bottoms-up understanding of the market and then put your pro forma together based upon market research, a forecast from some kind of customer Get that product into the market by focusing on contribution margin, meaning you're not wrapping dollar bills around it. That will drive scale, which gets you to gross margin, which ultimately allows you to grow your business. So too often, entrepreneurs are pressured to put these together, pick a bunch of big markets where they think their technology can go, and then build to pro forma based upon percentages of that market over time. That has very little, if any, credibility where if you have a technology product or service, you put the time and effort in to understand what the market needs, you bake that into your technology proof points and capabilities, really go out there and grind and get that first customer and exploit them, you'll find a bottoms up driven pro forma with credibility that makes you fundable and believable. That's the first piece. The second piece is probably the most important. How do you create value through your use of proceeds? Give investors a discernible piece-by-piece understanding of what value is going to be created with their money. Don't let them guess. So in the same way that you're building a bottom-up market-driven pro forma, you can do the same way based upon your technology, product, or service. At some level, doesn't matter what you do, we all start with some kind of a proof of concept. That's at the bottom of the value creation hockey stick. Based upon an understanding of that proof of concept, it has to get to a prototype that you can sample to the market. You're going to learn from that. You're going to budget for that. And that's ultimately going to land you a lead customer, which drives revenue. From there, revenue becomes profit. And from there, profit becomes a return on the invested capital that someone gave you. Do your best to lay out these value creation events against an aggressive but achievable timeframe. Then through your best efforts with your team, budget how much capital it will take to get to those value creation events and then build in a buffer. And then demonstrate that you as a leader can build the appropriate team and assemble the appropriate resources to pull it off. In the venture capital world, you'll hear them refer to series A, series B, series C. Those rounds of capital will pay for the blue circles that you see on this slide because there's an expectation that as that blue circle is achieved, you'll need more money, but now you can need and go get that more money at a higher price and a higher value. So understanding the discernible amount of cash needed to achieve those value creation events and then comparing them against a pro forma is how you as an entrepreneur can take a stage of your company that might be unbelievably unpredictable, but capture both tactical, emotional, and financial value in your storytelling exercise. And that's what I wanted to share with all of you based upon the data that we've gone through up until now. So that's sort of what I wanted to capture. I think I'm within the sort of 15 to 20 minute time frame that, that Christy laid out. It's a lot of data, but it gets you the key points of the narrative. And I'm now happy to sort of walk through, go back or answer any questions, Christy, that the team might have. Wonderful. Thank you, Tony. That was amazing. Uh, Team, go ahead and put your questions into the center Q&A panel. Um, From there, I'll aggregate those. Tony, tell us, you know, this has been a challenging year the last year. What are you excited? You touched on a few items in your presentation. What are you excited about for the future? Oh, that's, that's a hard question to ask me because it, it's, Phononic has been carrying itself for most of 2020 into 2021 in an unbelievably humbling way. Uh, this has been a difficult journey. It's romantic to be disruptive until you got to do the work, as we often say. Um, coming into 2020, the future of our company was still very much uncertain. We had been scattered. We had been defocused. Why, Christy? Because I was excited about everything. 
It, it's how I'm wired as an entrepreneur. I, don't tell us we can't do something ethanonic. We'll go into that market next. And that's an expensive way to run a railroad. So if you look at the segments that we're, we really locked into in 2020, 5G, microcooling and LIDAR, micro fulfillment, food storage and delivery, and then licensing of our vaccine and commercial refrigeration products. Those were exciting because it gave the company clarity and focus. It was humbling because in almost each vertical, our products are now being used in literally life-saving mission critical applications. I know a lot of entrepreneurs in the last 12 to 18 months whose companies have really suffered through circumstances that they can't control. So it's exciting to know that as the world initiates its recovery, the technology and products that we've developed that we've been telling people for a long time are really important to your life are now starting to bear fruit. So we're excited that that's happening, but we're humbled that it happened under the current circumstances that are affecting so many people. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, can you talk a little bit about your customer's customer? Yeah, so that's, that's an experiential, um, it's an experiential point. If you look at the kinds of markets that we're in, some are residential, some are commercial, entrepreneurs get incredibly caught up in whether or not their business model is B2B or B2C. You can't be both. We're, we're always lectured by, by investors and partners. What your customer's customer's customer is, and each time I do it, by the way, I add another customer onto it, is if you're going to enter into a segment, regardless if you're selling the product, licensing it uh, to, to any point of the value chain, you have to understand who at the end of the day is using it. If you want to go into the residential market, your customer's customer's customer is a household. If you want to get into the climate control segment, your customer's customer's customer is a builder or, 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 or a building operations manager. If you want to get into 5G and, and communications, it's a network equipment manufacturer that's building um, fiber optic communication networks. So the closer you could get to the end user and work backward from there, even if you don't sell to that end user, you'll incorporate into your technology product or service what that end user really cares about, as opposed to either guessing or being manipulated by the sales channel that you have to get through. The most dramatic example I could give you is in healthcare. We chose vaccine storage and protection, not because we had a great marketing team at the time that did any, any investigations, we had me. They used refrigerators. We heard that they complained about those refrigerators. They broke down. We went right to a hospital, went to the nurse's station and said, what don't you like about your job in terms of the administration of vaccines and drugs? And then quite literally worked backward through the hospital, the administration, and then sold them refrigerators and freezers under the Phononic brand. It was reckless. It was crude. It was the most incredible thing we did because now the top three healthcare brands in North America are standardizing key parts of their portfolio around our technology because we were willing to take that first step. Amazing. How many rounds did you go through in raising capital and what were some of the significant milestones that affected your fundraising? Too many. Um, and I was up late last night talking to bankers. So, so all of your, your, your viewers need to know that as an entrepreneurial CEO, you have two jobs. You're raising money or you're getting ready to raise money. It's that simple. Um, if you were to chart the financing we've done as a company, it very much tracks those hockey sticks presentations that I gave you. The early rounds of financing were largely associated with technology proof points. Do the materials work? Do the devices work? Do they meet certain standards that we all believe are the best guess as to what the market needs? Then the next group of milestones come into productizing that proof of concept and getting a lead customer. Then the milestones transition into revenue and more financially driven metrics of scale, and then ultimately profitability and cash flow. So if you look at the capital that we've raised, a disproportionate amount of it went into productizing the technology, because as good as our concepts and our chips and our third party data was, we really learned the hard way that no matter how progressive the partner in those markets that were laid out on those slides, dropping a chip in front of them with a provocative way to do refrigeration, they don't just pop up and retrofit $6 billion worth of fully depreciated manufacturing infrastructure that's about to get obsolete overnight. You're not welcomed in with open arms under those circumstances. So it was a tough road to slog through, but now over, particularly over the last 18 to 24 months, 
the capital that we're raising is now almost exclusively associated with growth and profitability as opposed to technology and validation. You have been both um, a venture capitalist and fundraiser on both sides. Um, what has that brought up for you or how have you learned through that process? It's kind of like being able to pull back the curtain. How has that affected you? Well, I was, I was junior in my career when I was on the investment side, which is a polite way of saying you had to do the grunt dirty work, which is as business plans and entrepreneurs came in pitching for money, I was the first line of defense, particularly because at that time I was fresh out of USC. I had a technical background. My job was to evaluate the science and the technology uh, and determine if it was either disruptive or something that the broader firm would want to support. You learn to respect the fundraising process, even on deals you pass on, even on pitches that are bad, um, that you know are never going to get funded. There's an honor and a respect in the fundraising process that I saw firsthand entrepreneurs mortgaging their houses, their homes, scraping dollars together, friends and family. Um, it's a grind. And you learn that it's a lifestyle. Um, and you're able to, 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 to appreciate what goes into that side of it. On the investment side, and I think too few entrepreneurs understand this, you need to understand how fund dynamics work. What is the ROI profile that a venture capital fund must realize? Uh, what is the pressure that a venture capital partner, even the most loyal partner, is getting from his or her partners that an exit is due, a return is needed, the fund's life is coming up? You have to understand both sides of the aisle. And I think it's helped me navigate the fundraising process, but also be honest with my own team here about what the market expects from us. Tell us a little bit more about the sustainability aspect of your solutions. Well, this, this is the part that everyone always identified with. And, and I should maybe step back, even from my, my time at USC and JPL, it, it didn't have a fancy name, but I've been in and around sustainability my entire career. It was called alternative energy. It was called clean tech. Uh, it, was, it was called sustainability. Now it's called ESG. It's called all different, different themes. So if you looked at what, what the fundamentals of thermoelectric cooling promise, is you're able to eliminate a mechanically driven process, but in doing so, you're completely eliminating the use of toxic or noxious gases in refrigerants, which have global warming impact that's dramatic. Over the next, I think 50 to 70 years, depending on the research, air conditioners are gonna bleed out more CO2 due to refrigerant leakage than automobiles will produce. That's unbelievable. The dilemma with thermoelectric cooling is the efficiency scale and cost in spite of the strong sustainability benefits had always lagged behind that of the incumbent. So as promising as it was, until those technical benchmarks were achieved, you would just fall behind. So what we're very proud of, and I, I think I'll use that word because it resonates differently with different people, is while we're incredibly grateful and proud of the sustainability wrapper of our technology products and solutions, we've always tried to position them to the customers, 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 customer, based upon what they care about. And unfortunately, most people don't care about sustainability. How much does it cost? Does it meet my performance? If the drugs or vaccines go down, I don't care how green it is, that's a catastrophic loss. If the data network goes down, I don't care how efficient it is, that's a catastrophic loss. If I have ice cream at the counter of a major grocery store that's got my brand in it and it's a completely sustainable footprint, but the product fails and my ice cream melts, that's a catastrophic loss. So the position that we've taken is to deploy our technology in these various markets, sort of come in through the back door and all of a sudden stand up and say, did you know that we now have tens of thousands of vaccine refrigerators, completely sustainable, Energy Star rated, and we've saved you X thousand tons of CO2? And Christy, people look at us dumbfounded. To me, that's a sustainability win. Amazing. Uh, As, Christy, you know, Christy ahead, this John. is John. Um, I'm not on the... Um, participants panel, so not able to type in the Q&A, but I did want to ask a question uh, to Tony. When you, you mentioned that you started, uh, you got your PhD at USC, and then you did your postdoc at JPL. Can you talk about the importance of government grants as far as the development of your technology, because you describe yourself as, as R&D, and, and then how you were able to commercialize that technology, and also did you have to enter into some licensing agreements uh, to maybe even use some of that technology. Well, John, that, that's, that's a full-on conversation because uh, you missed another important piece 
that doesn't always get remembered these days. Phononic was an, was an ARPA E award E in their first ever solicitation. So of the 5,000 companies that went into ARPA E's first ever solicitation, 37 were selected and Phononic was one of those 37. So based upon my research at USC, which was very applied, uh, the program at JPL in the same way in fuel cell and electrochemistry research, I think the fundamental importance of what the government grants did for us is through mechanics out of our control, the venture capital community, just by the size of large numbers or the law of large numbers, has moved beyond investing in companies doing fundamental research the way that they used to. Corporations in a similar manner, we're here in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina, where there are literally contract research organizations, which are unique to biotech. But in the broader industrial world where I came from, fundamental R&D has been sort of left on the chopping block by many of the, the traditional innovators of American business over the last 100 years. So both in the basic, fundamental, but both applied R&D that we got through the DOE, DARPA, and ARPA, it funded a thesis, which was the first slide of my presentation, that the venture capital community thought was sort of crazy. Too early, too fundamental, too unproven, no way, with the exception of Venrock and Oak Investment Partners, will we fund this kind of development work. They had the foresight to do that in partnership with ARPA-E, and we've taken it from there. And how about as far as licensing some of that information or some of that technology? Sure. Are you using so, that for uh, Phenotic? We are. So we were born out of a multi-university research initiative with the University of Oklahoma, UC Santa Barbara, and Caltech, where I've spent a considerable amount of time. And we licensed or established license agreements with those respective universities for both defensive and offensive IP. Caltech is a shareholder of Phenotic, now that I stop and, and, and think about it, as well as the University of Oklahoma. And that's critically important, particularly at the early days when the technology is unproven and still in development, having access to that IP and partnership with the, with the universities is critical. And John, when I was on the venture side, those were the deals we looked for. The early stage deals at universities where VCs were reluctant to go because the technology risk was overwhelming, let alone the company risk. And the license agreements and an understanding of how to do the licensing agreements is an important piece to give the company some stability and foundation as you get started. So we've leveraged it very well uh, since we were born. Do you have any advice to people? Because we've had some speakers talk about dealing with tech transfer at Caltech or USC, JPL, et cetera. Do you have any advice on people dealing with that? Oh, so I've advised, man, that's a, that, that, I have a lot of advice. So there's, there's advice on two sides. The first advice is dealing with the, with the, the faculty member slash entrepreneur, which often get a bad rap from the investment community. I had a co-founder at Phenonic, Dr. Patrick McCann at the University of Oklahoma, incredibly proficient and entrepreneurial, recognized his value as a fundamental R&D scientist. And we were very straight with one another when we started the company, which was there would be a role for him in the beginning where I needed him, his postdocs and the facilities at OU. He would be compensated through equity, as would OU in a license agreement. But we agreed on some technical specifications that once they were met, it's out of the university and in an operating, working, professional environment. And by being straight with one another, we had a great partnership uh, as we went through those early stages of development. On the university side, being transparent as to the economic and manufacturing and investment risks to take something from a license to a product is critical. Too often on all sides of the equation, the belief is that once a license agreement is signed, the work is done. All the license agreement is, is go. That's where you start the work. And if the investment community is transparent and shares that, listen, based upon this license, we're prepared to invest and invest heavily, which is why we're asking for certain economic terms, the deal will get done much more smoothly. Too often, both sides don't understand each other. So it tends to be a, a, a contentious discussion. Whereas if you just come at it organically and treat each other as partners, in our experiences, OU, Caltech, and UC Santa Barbara was absolutely seamless. Thank you. Um, as an academic and entrepreneur neighbor, how did you choose RTP as your location? 
Well, listen, you're offending a whole lot of smart people by calling me an academic. So I, I would, I would <laughs> no. hold off on, 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 on that. Uh, so, so listen, the foundations of Phononic are really a fun story. Um, I had known the venture community in the Valley in spite of moving to New York with the venture fund that I was with. And it was the, it was the venture team at Venrock, um, Matt Trevithick, and then the Venrock, the, the investment team at Oak that took an interest in this theme that I investigated. For 18 months, we were virtual where I happened to be living in North Carolina, where I was an entrepreneur in residence um, uh, for a company that we had invested in when I was on the venture side. So as I was cycling out of that deal, looking for new opportunities, what would ultimately become phononic came across my plate. So having put the foundational due diligence in structuring the license agreements and being virtual for 18 months, two very important things happened. Um, the technology started to look like it was going to work. And my family said they were going to effectively disown me if I spent one more week on an airplane. So needing to find a home and not particularly tied to the Research Triangle area, I conducted a search of the U.S. I did the Bay Area. I did Arizona. I did um, uh, Austin. I did Boston. And RTP really had an incredible confluence of factors where I could get access to semiconductor equipment immediately at NC State University Centennial Campus. And the triangle is uniquely situated because the triangle simply means NC State, Duke, and Chapel Hill are within a stone's throw of each other. And we're able to scale and scale relatively quickly. So my, my attorneys and many of my investors are still on the West Coast, as well as now in Singapore and Asia. Uh, we have a sales team in, the, in, in San Jose. We have a sales team throughout China and the bulk of our operations here in, in Carolina. So we're truly a global company um, every day of the week. Fantastic. Um, our last question, where can industrial manufacturing startups whose products have major positive societal impacts find funding? Um, there are some challenges right now with venture communities not considering these investments, despite the societal good that they might do. Do you have any ideas around that? Yeah. So if you're industrial, you're, you're levered with the same baggage that we carry. And I've learned the hard way that different parts of our life at Phononic, when we say semiconductor, people gloss over because one, it's hardware, two, it's physical, and three, it's got to be a billion dollars worth of equipment and manufacturing. That's super expensive. So tackling that head on, our team did an incredible job by developing semiconductor processes that don't require clean room, don't require lithography, require a dramatically lower footprint, which made the size of the market and the size of the outcome compared to the invested capital that was required allowable and, and tolerable where they've invested and they've invested heavily. So I think the first thing you need to do is societal benefit is great. We all want it, we all pursue it, but you have to monetize it in some way that that societal benefit translates into X dollars of shareholder value, X dollars of accretive growth, X dollars of enterprise value. I don't know what your world is, but you have to quantify the economic value created from your societal benefit. That's step one. Step two, what's the invested capital needed to bring it to life? If you're industrial, do you need a plant? Do you need a factory? Do you need equipment and manufacturing? Do you need partners to do that for you? That's the invested amount. Subtract those two. And if you've got a dramatically positive delta, the investment community, whether it's private equity, whether it's strategic or whether it's venture, will consider that investment. That was a lot of questions you answered in a short period of time. Thank you so much for going through that process with us. Um, it, did that bring up anything else for you that you'd like to talk about or close us with? I, I, I tend to talk fast. I move a mile a minute. Um, I dropped a lot of data on your team. Hopefully you, you found and could identify the thread and the narrative. Um, I would just think through what we covered this morning and, 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 and people tend to get fired up and excited about Phononic, including us. Just find that theme. Uh, or find the narrative from the presentation. That's really ride the lightning. If, if you believe there's a powerful theme to your technology product or service, I put that story together today almost chronologically so you can see how it's been told. There's a macroeconomic theme that's powerful that has societal benefit, right? And then we've tackled the technical market or technical product and market uh, requirements to get there. And now we're growing a, a, a pretty exciting business. So, so find the narrative that, that I covered today and apply it to what you're doing. Um, and hopefully you'll have, uh, you'll make progress. I love it. I love it. So I know there were a few questions that came in right at the end. 
if you guys want to stick around to ask those questions, in a moment we're going to transition over to open network, open networking. Tony is going to stick around with us for a little while, so we're super grateful that he's going to stick around, have some open networking. You can try and ask your questions then. Um, thank you, Tony, for being with us. Um, from North Carolina. Thank you for being part of a community that celebrates innovation. We really appreciate your time today. Fight on. Fight on. So next week, we're going to hear from the brilliant artist and scientist Enrique Martinez Celaya. He's going to talk to us about the guidance of perils of maintaining high standards, a higher standard. So in the meantime, stay safe and well. Thank you to our community for coming out today. We will see you next week. If you want to stay on the line for open networking, it'll take us just a minute to transition that over. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>